Thank you for joining us for Sermons on Demand from Friendship Grace Brethren Church. We provide these videos as a way to share the pulpit messages and teachings offered at Friendship Grace Brethren Church. If you find these videos a helpful resource, please drop us a note at info at friendshipgracebrethren.com. Now open your Bibles and get ready to dig into the Word of God. Okay, let's, uh, let's get started because we're way behind. My fault, sorry, thought I had everything working. And I didn't. One race, one blood, a biblical answer to racism. We're in, uh, in lesson three. And we need to focus on our starting points. The world does not have a starting point of Scripture. The world has a starting point of, of, a, of a very poor scientific theory. Um, Darwinian evolution has been abandoned by most intellectuals for what is now called neo-evolutionism that has a different set of principles from Darwinian evolution. Most have abandoned the idea that we have come, that we all come from a single celled thing at one point and life developed from that. Most have abandoned that. It's just not scientifically feasible. But they still, they still have some sort of evolutionism and so forth. And so the, the point of this, of this section is we're, we're going to be moving into the Tower of Babel, one of my favorite parts of Scripture on how that works, what God did in all of that. And that's our starting point. The starting point of the world, the evolutionary world, is common ancestor of sorts, um, evolution and development, uh, or nothing is ever made better through evolution. It only, it only deteriorates scientifically. So the, 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 the fall of the world, I guess. Uh, so we have to be careful to evaluate the claims of the origin that people make. So that's our focus, our overview this morning. Our, uh, our focus is racism is not consistent with a biblical perspective. Racism in no form is consistent with a biblical perspective. During our uh, time this morning, we, we hope to have... Uh, to connect starting points to their social implications. What is the social implication of a starting point of evolution? It devalues life, it devalues humanity, and makes them consistent with animal life. Makes humans consistent with animal life. Therefore, it's okay to kill a preborn baby, but not a whale. Right? I, I love the I love the cars that have save the whales, women's rights. Huh. Kind of a juxtaposition of positions. So connect their starting points to their social implications. There are implications to every reality or to every position we hold. Evaluate naturalistic statements using scripture. We will do that. Recognize that racism is not consistent with a biblical perspective. Now the reason this curriculum keeps bringing that up is the church has a long history of racism. It's unfortunate. It's not biblical. But the Bible has been, been mistaught to present to the world a racist viewpoint. The largest denomination, uh, Protestant denomination in the United States was founded on racist principles. I'll say that right, right here now. And I think their leadership today would admit that. The Southern Baptist Convention was founded on racist principles. Some biblical ones too, but on racist principles. I know Al Mohler would say that, and I, I think some of the others, and they're about to potentially elect their first black president, and that will certainly contribute to that. But it was founded on racist principles. Segregation. 
they, they are not, blacks are not capable of, uh, of understanding the gospel. That was part of the basis for the founding of that and other denominations. Most churches in the United States are segregated. Is that a racist thing? Maybe, but not necessarily. I would not say we're, we're racist because we have no blacks or Asians or Indians, dot or feather, which is probably a racist statement, um, here. People of like minds usually congregate together, so I'm not necessarily saying it's a racist thing, but it, there, there are origins to, uh, to the segregation of churches. So let's uh, do some introduction here. Those of you that have your workbooks, um, what did you observe as you studied Nehemiah 9? Nehemiah 9 is all about the history of Israel and the specific statements about them being set apart. I understand why some people have mistaught Scripture because it seems like that's what it says sometimes when you don't look at the totality of it. There are several times in Scripture that the Israelites stop and remember their history. It's good for us to do all the time. First, we can see a continuous rebellion of the Israelites. And it helps us understand how God dealt with them in the land. But second, it helps us to understand the hopelessness of the sin cycle. These were God's chosen people who were seen by God's mighty works and faithful, faithful provision time and time again. And still, they fell away into sin. I mean, they saw God part the Red Sea and their next move was to create an idol. So, they, you know, they didn't have their ducks in a row. Third, we see a list of God's great and mighty works reminding us of his power and authority. But even more significant, perhaps, is the stark contrast we've seen between sinfulness and God's mercy. If we don't start with God's word, then we must start with man's word, which elevates an evolutionary worldview. What social implications come from an evolutionary worldview? We talked about that briefly already. What happens is we devalue humanity. We devalue our value. God didn't create us like he created all the other animals. He created us differently, specifically. And he breathed into us the breath of life, which is not what he did to the animals. So there's something different for us. Now, during the, we're about to start the uh, video. During the video this morning, uh, observe these things as, as we're going through it. See some references to racism in the Bible. Some re ref uh, references to racism and culture. And then the main point, racism is not consistent with a biblical perspective. Okay, let's watch the movie. This is, uh, um, I forget his name all of a sudden. All right. I'll get over it. We'll see. Well, thank you, everyone. It's great to be here. Uh, my name is Bodie Hodge. I've been working at the Ministry of Answers in Genesis for uh, over 15 years now. So I'm kind of like a staple. I've been here for a long time. I'm just uh, getting up there in, in my age now, it feels like. But I'm going to talk to you today about the subject of the Tower of Babel. And I'm going to look at some of the different fascinating aspects about the Tower of Babel. I'm also going to look at some of the cultural aspects. A lot of these will actually hit home. And so I really hope uh, you guys have a, have a great time with this particular talk. Well, what kind of attacks are there when it comes to the Tower of Babel? There's actually quite a few. Uh, for those of you who are familiar with Genesis, Genesis comes under attack quite a bit, especially in today's culture. Uh, whether it's creation right there at the very beginning, whether it's the flood of Noah's day, we've seen a lot of attacks on that. But do you realize the Tower of Babel also comes under significant attack? Uh, just to give you an idea, some of these attacks, uh, the two that I'm going to hit in this particular talk is where people claim that the Tower of Babel is just mythology. It doesn't make sense of our world. Another aspect is the, the issue of racism in today's culture. Let's face it, racism is bad, isn't it? 
I mean, I've been in various parts of the world, and I've seen a lot of forms of racism, and it's a terrible thing. Now, as a Christian, I want to encourage Christians, hey, we should be the ones leading the fight against racism in our culture, and there's good reasons for that. Now, there's a host of other attacks, but I'm not going to go into all the detail of each one of those, but let's face it, there are people who are attacking the Tower of Babel. Uh, I hopped on the internet, and I typed in the Tower of Babel. The very first link that came up was Wikipedia. For those of you who are familiar with Wikipedia, Wikipedia changes every day. It's somewhat uh, anti-Christian, but that was the very first link. You go to the very first line, and what do they say? It's an origin myth. Right there, very first thing people would look up. You look up Encyclopedia Britannica online, look at this. They call it a mythological tower in Babylonia. I'm telling you, kids today, people today, all around, researchers, when they look up the Tower of Babel, the first thing they're hit with is, oh, this is just a myth. You can't trust that stuff. That's the kind of stuff that comes from the Bible and Genesis. Well, I'm here to tell you, the Bible can be trusted. It does make sense of the world. And I'm going to dive into this subject. The first thing I really want to dive into, though, is the issue of races and racism in our culture. We hear this term quite a bit. And I've had people say, oh, well, there's all these different races. Um, I've actually spoken in prisons, and I've had people try to tell me that there's a multitude of races. Hey, if we start with the Bible, and we all go back to Adam and Eve, how many races of mankind are there? One. We're not used to thinking that way, are we? You see, we've been conditioned by our culture to try to dive, divide people up into a multitude of different races by how they look, whether it's skin tone, whether it's hair, whether it's eye shape. Friends, I want us to step back and start with God and his word. There's one race, the human race. Acts 17, 26. Uh, this is Paul speaking, by the way. And he's speaking of God here. And he has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on all the face of the earth and has determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwelling. But I love this from one blood. We are all related. I look out at my audience right now. We're related. Whether you want to be related to me or not, we're related. Right? That's right. Amen, brother. <laughs> you see, we are one blood. But we're in a culture that has conditioned us to look a little different at that. And there's reasons for that. I'm going to dive into that here in a little bit. But see, I've had people say, well, why do people look so different? Why do we see all these, these different forms of human being? These people, with some people have darker skin than I do. Some people have lighter skin. People have darker hair. Some people have hair. <laughs> God love them. <laughs> but you see, we have variation. And there's a reason for it. You know, Adam and Eve looked a certain way. And after Adam and Eve, they had descendants, and their descendants did not look exactly like Adam and Eve. Go figure that one out. They, you know, they have variation within their children. That's expected uh, with their genes. You go all the way up, you have the bottleneck at the flood of Noah's day. Then you have Noah and his family come off the ark. The Lord told them, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth. What'd they do? They built a city and a tower and said, let's not be scattered. So the Lord confused their language and different family groups went to different parts of the world, taking a particular gene pool with them. And that's what dominates in that area. It actually makes sense. Now I'm going to look at this in more detail because the issue of racism is bad. It's terrible. In fact, I hopped on the internet and I said, okay, what kind of racist acts are out there? Boy, you type that in the internet, it's all over the place. There's headlines everywhere. You can see all sorts. There was a, 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 a killer recently went into Kroger, and they, that's a, apparently a, a racist uh, individual that went in there for that purpose. We see all sorts of different things. I could have put thousands of headlines up here. That's how bad it is just here in the United States. You look across the Western world, we see just as many problems. When I was in Australia, I saw forms of racism. When I was in Sweden, I saw forms of racism. There's a lot. It's all over the place. But let's look back into the past, because we've seen a lot of racist acts back in the past as well. Many of us sitting in this room could probably name specific instances where somebody had been racist to us. And in many cases, there may have been times when we were racist to someone else. Sometimes we may not have even realized it. But consider an individual here named Odabinga. He was from Africa. He was a pygmy. You know what they did to him? They actually put him on display in a zoo, locked him up with the orangutans, put him on display. Hey, look at this guy. He's like an animal. I'll tell you what, that played on him. Ultimately, Christian saw it and got him, got him released, but he ended up killing himself. What about the Nazis? You go back to Germany, World War II, and even the precursor times leading up to that. They had a breeding program that they called Lebensborn. With Lebensborn, essentially, they were trying to breed a master race. They did forced sterilization. Sometimes married people were forced to have children with people that they viewed as being higher on the evolutionary scale. 
I mean, you gotta understand the way the Nazis were thinking. They were thinking in terms of an evolution, millions of years uh, type of a worldview. And with that, they said, okay, Darwin taught that people evolved out of Africa from lower apes. And so apes had darker skin, so they viewed lighter skin as being more evolved. Apes, they said, had a lot of hair, so less hair was more evolved. Apes had dark hair, so maybe blonde hair was more evolved. Apes had dark eyes, so maybe big blue eyes were more evolved. Light complexion things. I always wonder, what were they shooting for? <laughs> as sad as this is, Beavis and Homer Simpson fit the category. As terrible as that is. But you see, that was the way that they were thinking. They attacked Jews, they attacked Poles, Slavs, Africans. They attacked all sorts of people. But what else did that philosophy lead to? Do you realize that an evolutionary worldview even led to graves being desecrated by Australian Aborigines? There were even instances where they were hunted and their bodies were put on display in museums around the world. It's terrible to see these types of atrocities. If somebody isn't outraged at these types of things, uh, then there's something wrong with them. These things were terrible atrocities. Now I want to step back and I want to look at this issue. And I want to look at it from a big picture. Big picture here. Either God's right or he's not. Let me ask you, is God right? God is always right. And when God says that we all go back to Adam and Eve, Adam was the first man, Eve is the mother of all the living, there is one race. But if you reject God and his word, by default, man becomes the authority. And when you reject God, anything goes. Now I want to encourage you to start with the Bible. Let the Bible be the absolute authority at everything you look at, even when it's looking at other people. You see, if we go back to the early pages of the Bible, do you realize man was created supernaturally and unique? We're not like animals, not even close. Genesis 2.7, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils, the breath of life, and man became a living being. Yeah, our bodies are made from dust. That's why it can return to dust once we sin. But you see, God made our bodies, but where did the life come from? It came from God. God breathed life into us. You see, we as mankind, we are made in the image of God. Then the woman was made from the rib, from the side, from Adam. Genesis 2.22, then the rib, which the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and he brought her to the man. See, man and woman, we are both made in the image of God. We were both made supernaturally and unique. Hey, is this too hard for an all-powerful God to do this? No. no, this is all too easy. I've had people say, well, Eve should have been a clone if she make, came from Adam. No, this is God we're talking about. This isn't a problem, okay? But I've had people say, but Bodie, we're in a culture. Look around. We see all these people who are red and yellow and black and white. Why are we conditioned to look at that? I've had people come up to me and say, hey, Bodie, you're a white person. No, 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 no. I don't know if you guys have seen anything that's white. Here, let me show you something that's white. We got all sorts of things that are white, and I don't know if you can see this up here. I'm gonna try to pull it off so you can see it just a little bit better. And I'll show you what, what white looks like. Ready, ready? Well, almost ready. Almost ready, technology, I'm telling you. Ah, this is white. Now I'm gonna put this up to my skin. You tell me, am I white? Am I even close to that color? No, I'm not. If I look like that, call a hearse. <laughs> Ambulance isn't gonna help. It's all over with. No, I'm kind of brownish. In fact, we're all kind of brownish. Some are more brown, some are less brown. It's not a big deal. When you start with scripture, it makes sense of that. You see, we see this variation in different people. That's not a big deal. God loves that variety. But you see, when you reject God and his word, people start looking at this variety from an entirely different viewpoint. So why, why do some people look darker? Why do some people look lighter? Why do we see variations in people? It actually goes back to our DNA. DNA does not stand for the National Dyslexia Association. <laughs> yeah, some of you guys got that right off the bat. Come on, we gotta have a little fun with this. It's a tough subject, but we can still have some fun with it. Deoxyribonucleic acid, it's actually a fascinating code system that codes for the way our whole bodies are built. It's got an incredible amount of information in it, so much information in the human genome. Our DNA is made up of about three billion base pairs. Now what that equates to, if you count this as information, about a thousand books of 500 pages of information. That's an incredible amount of information. I love looking at this kind of stuff, but, but what our DNA codes for are things like skin shape, 
eye shape, eye color, hair amount, hair color. I got the genetics that causes my hair to fall out on my head. It starts to grow on my back. I don't get that one. But apparently I've got the genetics for that. But let's just get an idea of how much information is contained in that genome. If any two people, male and female, had a child, how many different children can they have that won't be identical by, by getting information from mom and dad? Not necessarily identical twins or triplets where it's the same DNA that splits. You know how many it would be? 10 to the power of 2017. This, you can't even imagine that number. This is a 10 with 2017 zeros after. It's tough to even imagine that. Now let me give you a comparison. The estimated number of atoms in the entire known universe is somewhere in the neighborhood of 10 to the power 80th. I'll tell you what, that gives you a taste of the mind of God, doesn't it? When he created mankind. But you see, we see variations in people, and that's not a big deal. That's a lovely thing. That's a lovely thing. But you know, if we look at, say, animals, we see variation in animals too, don't we? We see variation in plants and a lot of different things. Do you realize when God created things in Genesis chapter 1, he said he created them after their kind or according to their kind? Hey, let me ask you, do animals change? Yeah, they change. Like, like, you guys like dogs? Yeah, you guys like dogs, that's right. Do you guys like cats? <laughs> Not so much, okay. We're gonna stick with the dogs in this example. I mean, we see a variation of dogs up here on our screen. If you start at the far left, you got this wolf-like creature, that's a pretty dog. That's a shaggy dog, that third one. The next one in, that's an ugly dog. That, that's a cute dog. That's a really ugly dog. And, well, that's a dog. It looks like a rat, but it's a dog. <laughs> but you see, you see, these are all dogs. These are just variations in these dogs, right? Do you realize that all these dogs can ultimately interbreed with each other? They're part of the one dog kind. That's what we like to say. Here's a number of different uh, domesticated dogs. We've got a variety of those, more domesticated dogs. All the domestic dogs are actually classed as one species. And yet, look at the variation we see just in those. So how is it that we get all this variation within dogs all around the world? Let's think about this. Let's go back into the past. Noah comes off the ark, and he has two of each kind on board the ark, right? Of the land-dwelling, air-breathing animals. He has two dogs on board the ark. These two dogs come off the ark, and they fall in love and get married. Now, I'm going to teach you some genetics. Now, now, don't let me scare you with this. It's actually a lot more complicated than this, but let, let me explain it like this. Let's say these two dogs have medium-length fur. And let's say that they have the genes for long hair and short hair in there. And let's say that when those two are together, that expresses medium length fur. Now, like I said, it is more complicated than this. But let's say they get married and they have babies. Well, what kind of babies can they have? Well, they can actually have babies have short hair fur because they get the short hair gene from mom and the short hair gene from dad. Or they can have others with medium length fur where they get a long hair and a short hair from either mom or dad. They can even have babies that have all long hair because they get a long hair gene from mom and a long hair gene from dad. So all of a sudden in one generation, you can have dogs with long hair, medium length fur, or short hair, all right there in one generation. Now, these dogs come off the ark, and you know, if you know anything about dogs, dogs have more dogs. And dogs have more dogs, and they have more dogs. If you know anything about dogs, you end up with lots of dogs. Not to be confused with hot dogs, you can eat hot dogs. I don't know if you wanna eat hot dogs, because if you know what's in a hot dog, you may not want to eat that. But either way, you're going to get lots of dogs. And dogs like to eat hot dogs too, just so you know. Whew. Good thing I don't have to say that twice. But you end up with lots of dogs. Now, dogs start to go to different parts of the world. Now, some parts of the world get hot. Some parts of the world get cold. You go up north. It gets cold up north. Okay, so the dogs that go up north, it gets cold up there. So do you think the dogs with short fur like that? No, they don't like that. In fact, what ends up happening, let's say you get some dogs go up to the far north, the dogs that like that are the dogs with the long fur. They can survive in that real easy. The dogs with short fur or medium length fur, they're either gonna move away or die off. So you're only gonna be left with a population of dogs with long haired fur up north, okay? Same sort of thing if the dogs go to a place that becomes a Sahara desert, it starts to get hot. <laughs> Uh, the dogs with shorter fur, they actually prefer that. The dogs with long hair fur, they don't like that. They're going to move away or die off. So you're going to be left with a population of dogs that only have short fur. See how you get the variation as animals go to various parts of the world. It's actually not that big of a deal. We see variations. But I want you to notice these dogs don't change into cats. 
They don't change into elephants or dinosaurs. They don't change into anything. These are dogs, and you see a variation in the dogs. Dingoes, for example, have lost the information for long hair. Collies here have lost the information for short hair, but they're still all dogs. Chihuahuas lost a lot of information. <laughs> Those poor things, they're so ugly, people put clothes on them in Hollywood. <laughs> just picking on the chihuahuas here. But I want you to notice, these types of variations are not evolutionary changes, okay? These are just dogs changing into dogs. You see, in an evolutionary worldview, let's just go back. In an evolutionary worldview, if you start with some sort of single-celled organism like an amoeba, and it's gonna evolve all the way up into a dog up here, you're gonna have to add new information to its genome. You need to add information for hair. You need to add information for a brain, add information for a circulatory system and a nervous system and so forth. Those are not the changes we observe. What we observe are variations within the dogs. Dogs changing into dogs. That's what we call a horizontal variation, not a vertical variation. We see this of other creatures, not just dogs. We see variations in chickens. And even these, these are some of the domestic chickens. Some of these are really, I've seen some of these real Transylvanian naked neck chickens. They are ugly. Oh, ugly looking chickens. But you know, some of these chickens can actually interbreed with things like pheasants and with turkeys and things. They're all part of that fowl kind. So you see variations in this sort of thing. Same sort of thing with horses. Here's a number of our domesticated horses, but they can actually breed with things like donkeys and with things like zebras and so forth. You see variation within this horse kind. It's not a big deal. So when we look at people, we need to think along the same lines. Same but different. You see, when it came to the dogs, the environment affected them. When they went to a cold place, it affected them. Humans are a little different. We defy the natural elements, don't we? It gets cold, what do we do? Put clothes on. Build a fire, build a house. You see, we can defy that sort of thing. But people still get divvied up to different parts of the world according to the Tower of Babel. And that explains that a little bit more. But you know, I've heard people say, but, but what about the skin tones themselves? Red and yellow and black and white. Doesn't that remind you of a little kid's song? Red and yellow, black and white, they are precious in his sight. Do you realize there's kids around the world singing that a little different? They're singing shades of brown from dark to light, they are precious in his sight. Do you realize that's actually more accurate? And here's why, let me explain this. You know, there's a pigment in our skin. There's, a, there's actually a couple, but one of the main ones is one called melanin. It's a brownish pigment that appears in your skin. And if your genes say produce more of this, you're gonna be darker on the scale. If your genes say produce a little bit less of it, you're gonna be lighter on the scale. Now this Im image actually came from National Geographic. They lined up a bunch of girls in a classroom just to show you it's one color. It's just how much is there? Do you have more of this melanin color? Do you have less of this? See, we're not usually taught to look at things like this. I think this was brilliant research that they did, just lining these guys up. You see, I probably sit somewhere in here. And then after summer, I'm somewhere in here. I move over a little bit. You know how sound affects that too. But you see, this goes back to our genetics. Now I'm gonna put a little bit more genetics out there. Of course, it's even more complicated than this too. But let's say that we have two parents up here that have capital A, small a, capital B, Small b. Now, I'm, I'm like, oh boy, I'm throwing some big stuff out here. Let's say the capital A and the capital B stand for produce lots of melanin. Let's say the small a and the small b say, well, let's produce smaller amounts of melanin. So let's say, how many different children can they have? Well, you can have children who are really dark where they get the capital A's and the capital B's from both mom and dad, or children who are really light, small a, small b down here on the lower right to produce very little bits of melanin. You can see the variation all the way through here. Now it's even more complicated than this, of course. But look, notice, you can get people who are really dark to really light in one generation. I've had people say, no, no, that takes thousands of years. You've gotta be kidding me, that, uh -uh, not at all. Oh yeah, it can happen. It really can happen. I want you to take a look at these uh, Horder twins, just, just absolutely beautiful. Here they are as children. Here they are kind of grown up a little bit more. But both of these parents had a light and a dark parent. And so they actually came out kind of middle brown. And look at those beautiful twins. Dark hair, dark skin, dark eyes, blonde hair, blue eyes, fair skin. It's twins, right there. You know what, we see a lot of examples of this. Uh, here's a, a couple of girls, uh, Grant uh, twins. They had a uh, father who was Jamaican and their mother was English. Here's another set, mixed doubles. Another set. Here, uh, 
Um, the mother was a mix between English and Nigerian, and the father was English. Look at those little twins. Ryan and Leo, look at those cute little kids. A German father and an a African mother from Ghana. Oh, I love this one. Twin Credibles. Two sets of two-tone twins. How cool is that, right? Absolutely beautiful. Oh, I just love seeing things like this. But notice, this is just a variation in your genetics. Produce more melanin, produce less melanin. Hey, it's something very similar with your, with your eye color, too. More melanin versus less melanin. Of course, you can get variations all throughout there. And I, you know, I, I'm blown away by this kind of stuff. But you see, if you go back to the genetics, we have variations even in our eye shape because of our genetics. You know, we can look at piece after piece of humans and why we look a little bit different, but it goes back to our genetic makeup. That's what it is. Biologically, I want you to understand, biologically, there is one race, the human race. That's what it is. Well, why is racism so prevalent in our culture today? I mean, if people were starting with the Bible, saying, hey, we all go back to Adam and Eve, we're all related, should there be racism? Nope. In fact, when we get to heaven, there isn't going to be any racism. Amen, right? That's something to look forward to. But we're not in heaven. Instead, we're in a sin, cursed, and broken world where a lot of false ideas become popular. Consider this one. The evolution of man. We've been drilled with this one. I've been drilled with this left and right. Tell me if you've ever heard this story. Man evolved out of Africa from a lower eight. Man was not very smart, kind of like a dumb brute. Finally, we got smart enough that, that we could actually start planting our own crops instead of being a hunter and gatherer. Finally, you get smart enough to, to start producing real good crops, and, and then you, you get smart enough to say, you know what, let's just stay here and build our own shelter. It's kind of rudimentary at first. Finally, you get smart enough, you can, you can build fancier houses or at least fancier shelters. Then, then you get to a point where you can develop your own civilizations like Indus Valley, Mesopotamia, or Egypt, places like that. I heard that over and over again. Do you know what? Ancient historians don't mention anything of the sort. We don't see that from ancient historians. That is a brand new, rewritten history that has been imposed upon generations of people. Darwin was the first one to propose that man evolved out of Africa. He proposed that in his book, The Descent of Man, because that's where you find the apes, and he believed we evolved from apes. Totally in contrary to what God says in his word. This philosophy goes all the way back to an alleged Big Bang. Essentially, there was nothing. No time, no space, nothing at all. Something pops into existence from nothing, rapidly explodes or expands. They claim that happened anywhere from about 13 to 15 billion years ago. And then you have the evolution of the universe. Finally, we get the first life in here where you have what's called chemical evolution, where chemicals come together and form the first life and it evolves further and further to where you finally get people. And you know what they taught a lot of these early evolutionists? They taught, well, some people are more evolved than others. This is what Darwin taught. And they, they had a multitude of races, but usually what a lot of these early evolutionists had was four different races. Now, I'll, I'll be honest, I don't like these terms, I don't like saying it, but this is what they had. They had the Caucasoid, or the Caucasian, the Mongoloid, the Negroid, and the Australoid. And they actually went so far as to rank them. They put the Caucasians on top and they put the Australian Aborigines at the bottom. Can you see why their graves were desecrated and they were hunted? Because people were looking at them as though they were some sort of missing link. Oh, I hate, hate this type of terminology. In fact, here's what I'd like to do. I'd like to just get rid of the term races. Just throw it in the trash. Toss it out. Let it be gone. Because we have different people groups, different family groups in various parts of the world. Nevertheless, a lot of these early evolutionists, they were really teaching that there were higher and lower races. One of the uh, early evolutionists, uh, he was a German man named Ernst Haeckel. He wrote a book called The History of Creation, popularized an evolutionary worldview to the German people, which ultimately led to Nazism. There's a big connection in there. But look what he says here. He says, at the lowest stage of human mental development are the Australians, some tribes of the Polynesians, and the Bushmen, the Hottentots, and some of the Negro tribes. Let me ask you, would something like that fuel racism? Yes, it would. Where did he get this idea? He got it from Charles Darwin himself in his book, The Descent of Man. 
Charles Darwin says, at some future period, not very distant as measured by centuries, the civilized races of man will almost certainly exterminate and replace the savage races throughout the world. At the same time, the anthropomorphic apes will no doubt be exterminated. The break between man and his nearest allies will then be wider, for it will then intervene between man and a, and a more civilized state, as we may hope, even than the Caucasian, and some ape as low as a baboon, instead of now between the Negro or Australian Aborigine and the gorilla. You know what Darwin's saying here? The Caucasians are on top and they should wipe out everyone else. Sadly, the Nazis tried to do that sort of thing and there's other people still trying to promote these types of terrible ideas. But you can see why the Australian Aborigines were hunted. Their graves were desecrated and all sorts of terrible atrocities occurred with them. Now I want you to understand something. I want to throw a caveat out there. Evolution is not to cause racism. Racism was around long before that. But once people started to buy into an evolutionary worldview, it just exploded because it was inherently a racist philosophy. Uh, Stephen Jay Gould, he was a former professor at uh, Harvard University, he died a few years back. He says, biological arguments for racism may have been common before 1850, but they increased by orders of magnitude following the acceptance of evolutionary theory. You see, they actually fit very well together. I've had people say, but Bodie, aren't there all these missing links that prove evolution? No, not at all. Let me explain that for just a moment. Let me drop into that. There's three ways people try to make a missing link, three. One, you take bones of a human, you take bones of an ape, and you try to build a missing link. But is that even a real creature? No, because you got bones of human and bones of ape. That's not even a real creature. You're just trying to you know, make a Lego building of some sort you know, with those bones. The second way to try to make a missing link is you take an ape and you try to make it look like a human. And we see instances of that. Uh, Lucy, for example, Australopithecine afarensis, that's just a, an ape, a variant form of chimpanzee. And what do they do? They try to make it look as human-like as possible, make it stand up in museums uh, almost as tall as me, uh, make it, give it human hands and feet and human eyes and things like that. They're taking an ape, trying to make it look like a human. And of course, the third way to make a missing link is you take a human and you try to make it look like an ape. That's a great case with Neanderthal. Neanderthal's a human. Wore clothes, they made musical instruments, they worshiped, uh, you know, they were clearly human. All the features of a Neanderthal are within the human population even today. But what do you see in a lot of the artist's illustrations is they take this human, they try to put ape-like features on it. Now there's a lot of defunct missing links and things like that floating around out there. Here's just a handful that may pop up in the news. And I know uh, some of these uh, may be difficult for you to read. Uh, but Neanderthals right up here at the top, what is it? We just break it down, it's a human. What you're typically finding are humans and apes. You know, in some cases you find some extinct apes and whatnot. Sometimes you have a junk category where they take some of the human bones and some of the ape bones and put it together. In some cases, they're so desperate to find missing links, like Ida down here, it's a lemur. Huh, I'm telling you, people really want their missing links. But we just need to step back and realize there's one race, the human race. And when it comes to missing links, there's a reason they're called missing links, because they're missing. They're not there. Well, friends, I want to encourage you, if you want to find out more about the subject of racism, particularly in our culture, some of the scientific problems with it, this is an incredible book, One Race, One Blood. It's by Ken Ham, the founder of the, of the Ministry of uh, Answers in Genesis. He's the CEO of the ministry. And Dr. Charles Ware. Uh, he's an African-American who uh, actually is a president of Crossroads Bible College. And, you know, he deals with a lot of the cultural issues of this powerful book. And I would encourage you to consider that one. Questions, comments? You sure did. Oh, David Barton? Not yet. This is this is that's is laying the groundwork. Yeah, coming up uh, next uh, is Tower of Babel two. Not today, but next, Lord willing, next week. Any other questions about uh, what he covered? I, I I love the simplistic illustrations of of the dogs and of the light skin and dark skin uh, for people and so forth that shows so much of what we know. I've talked about it before, the Human Genome Project was a, uh, or is, an ongoing research project where they're, they're collecting DNA samples 
from all around the world and they're, they're trying to fit them together. And one of the first findings of the Human Genome Project was a perceived location where our, our most common ancestor was from. I don't know how they get location. There's no GPS information in your DNA, but um, they determined it was uh, at first in northeastern Africa. As, the, as they studied more and more and more, they began to see, oh, maybe, maybe we're, we're southwest a little bit, and they moved it more northeast into what is today Iran, Iraq, where we believe the Tower of Babel was, where we believe the uh, uh, Garden of Eden was, and so forth. And so science itself has concluded that it looks like our most common ancestor is, it was from that region. And now they've narrowed it down. They, they won't say a single man, but they have said a single woman appears to be the source of all of our DNA. Well, duh. Uh, but it's interesting to me that they can't argue that away anymore. They argued it away for a long time, but now science is starting to say, no, all of this has some ancestral origin, and they look at it and, and come to those conclusions. Um, I would, I would uh, suggest, we don't have time to do it this morning, suggest that go through your, if you, if you downloaded the, the book, that you would go through and uh, or bought the book, go through and do the student activities and the applications. Uh, there's some good study in there, there's some good research, and we'll continue, Lord willing, next week. We'll see the second half of this talk, um, the dispersion of Babel, or from Babel. One of my most fascinating topics to study is Babel because it contributes to my discussion of Kufology. We're going to talk about that in, this, in the message a little bit this morning, too. Questions, comments? Father, thank you for men like Bodhi Hodge and the study that he's done for Ken Ham starting a ministry a long time ago to focus on what's said in the first 11 chapters of your word that are dismissed by so many, even within the church. So many within the church dismiss everything that comes before Abraham in Scripture, and that is a travesty, and it causes there to be so much bad theology that follows. Thank you for men like these guys that have uh, studied this and have worked on it and, and have presented to us uh, I, I, ways that we can understand it, ideas that we can comprehend that's all consistent with what you have said. Thank you for that. Meet with us this morning as we worship you through music and as we worship you through fellowship and through further study of your word. We love you and we want to serve you in Jesus' name. Thank you for watching or listening to this teaching on demand from Friendship Grace Brethren Church. Please consider sending us an email at info at friendshipgracebrethren.com to let us know how this teaching may have helped you. Please also consider joining us in person at Friendship Grace Brethren Church located at 10251 Metro Parkway, Suite 116, Fort Myers, Florida, just south of the intersection of Metro and Colonial Boulevard. Sunday school begins at 9 and worship service at 10 a.m. We look forward to seeing you in person at Friendship Grace Brethren Church.